Hello and welcome to Launch Sign Politics at Midday, where we bring you all the biggest stories across political lines in the country. I'm Jeff Rizal. Coming up. The election petition tribunal in River State reserves judgment in the petition filed by the governorship candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Mr. Tony Cole. Minister of Aviation, Mr. Festus Kayama, says the industry is set to witness major changes in the coming days. And Governor of Oshun State, Ademola Deleke, in reaction to incessant cult attacks witnessed in the state in recent times, direct security agencies to launch special operations to arrest the situation. Thanks again for joining us on the program. Let's kick things off from the nation's capital, where the Tinubu administration appears resolute to define the nation's engagement with the international community. And the president's recent invitation to participate as guest at the G20 meeting in India perhaps indicates Nigeria's growing influence on the global stage. The president used the summit to project the nation's economic priorities and forge new partnerships to promote sustainable growth. This next report looks at the impact of Nigeria's participation in that meeting. President Bola Tinubu was one of the leaders invited to attend the 18th edition of the G20 summit held in New Delhi, India, though Nigeria is not a member of the global body. While the body admitted the African Union as a permanent member, it afforded President Tinubu an opportunity to meet global leaders and fish for foreign direct investment. <laughs> On the sidelines of the summit, the president participated in two critical meetings, the Nigeria-India Presidential Roundtable and the Nigeria-India Business Conference. For the president, the summit represents perhaps his first significant international outing within the context of investment facilitation, resource mobilization, and building economic partnerships across borders since his assumption of office. President Tinubu has gone to India in two days and secured $14 billion worth of investment pledges, uh, of which we laid it out in detail exactly what companies were involved, what the sectors they're involved in, and how it's going to impact on the Nigerian economy. First of all, they're going to establish Nigerian subsidiaries, number one. And then number two, uh, we were very uh, active about uh, the, the, the process of uh, creating a handshake. Going by the reports from India, it was a fruitful outing for Nigeria following the attraction of private capital. We are seeing the ver um, foreign investments coming in, which is good. Um, if you look at our foreign investment, direct, direct foreign investments last, last year, 2022, it was negative. So that means that more money, we had more outflows than inflows. I'm sure you heard of um, some um, companies that closed down in Nigeria. So that, of course, that's, that's, that, those are negatives. But now we want to get positive. We want to see how foreign direct investments would be contributing to the development, to the GDP generally. What happens on the margin? is what is usually most beneficial to the countries. Because that's where you meet the key players. And look, President uh, uh, Bolatino, who has met this, this player, these are people who can take decisions on the spot. Those people who have been looking forward to cutting out away all protocol and middlemen, and they want to talk directly to the president of the country. Beyond these meetings, experts want the government to do more to sustain the flow of foreign private equity into the country. You have two million small and medium scale enterprises. You give them a tax holiday. They are able to recruit two to three persons. That is additional four, sorry, four or six million Nigerians getting out of poverty because of their earning, earning um, living wage. So it has to be, the environment has to be conducive. This is a time to stop wastage. This is time to begin to, to develop ourselves, to add value. Enough of sending raw materials. The Indian trip is one of the many that the president will be having over the course of his tenure. And if the outcome of the Indian trip is anything to go by, Nigerians may look forward to a more promising engagement by the Tinubu administration with the international community. And it's now a waiting game for reverse politics as the governorship election petition tribunal sitting in Abuja 
has reserved judgment in the petition filed by the governorship candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Mr. Tony Cole. Mr. Cole is challenging the victory of Governor Senelai Fibara of the People's Democratic Party. Aside from Mr. Cole, the immediate past governor of River State, Mr. Nyeson Wike, who is the current FCT minister, was present in court for the day's proceedings but did not speak to journalists on the day's activity. A three-member tribunal led by Justice Cletus Emifoye adjourned the martyr for judgment after the parties adopted their final written addresses and presented their arguments for and against the petition. Mr. Cole had called over 40 witnesses to support his claim that Governor Fubara was not qualified at the time of election to run for the River State governorship seats. Today, parties adopted their written addresses and the matter is now adjourned for judgment. We fought this case through and through. We called about uh, 40 witnesses and then uh, tendered exhibits running into the thousands. The respondents also uh, did so. And the main plank of our case is that the second respondent was at the time of the election not qualified because he didn't resign from his post as a Canton general and permanent secretary in River State. We led evidence to that effect. Have addressed extensively on it today, and we await the judgment of the tribunal. The matter was for adoption of written addresses, and by written addresses, what is meant is that all the submissions of all the various parties that were put that were put in writing, the legal arguments will be adopted and elaborated upon, which is what we did today. You see, there's a provision of the Constitution which says that um, a candidate must resign before the date of election. Uh, all throughout the electoral history, that date of election has always been the date set by INEC. But curiously, in this case, uh, the petitioner is insisting that it is the date of the primaries of his party. However, we think that the law does not envisage such a nebulous date because each of the 20, 23 parties contesting in the election have their different dates of primaries. So you can't have disparate dates as the day of the election. So that explains why uh, we joined issues on them that resigned well before the general elections. Yeah, those state local government elections may have come and gone. However, the Labour Party chairmanship candidate for Oredo local government area, Mr. Yasanto Daniel Ero, has written to the chief judge of the state, requesting the urgent establishment of local government election petition tribunal in the state. The letter by Mr. Ero, which had the chief justice of Nigeria in copy, expressed deep concern and growing frustration regarding the setting up of the local government election tribunal to address disputes arising from the recently concluded September 2 LG polls. He emphasized that Section 78 of the Edo State Local Government Election Law 2012 mandates the Chief Judge of Edo State to establish election tribunals promptly after an election to address and resolve disputes arising from the electoral process. And to more stories now, it appears the nation's aviation industry is set to witness some major changes in the coming days going by the plans which were unveiled by the Minister of Aviation and Aerospace Development, Mr. Festus Kiyamo. The minister listed maintenance, repair, and overhaul of facilities and aircraft leasing as some of the priorities of the ministry. According to him, the plans also include upgrading the Cat 3 landing systems and aerotropolis development in major airports across the country, all with the aim of driving the vision of making Nigeria Africa's aviation hub. May Sakayamo reeled out his plans during the seventh edition of the Africa Aviation Summit in Abuja. In order to attract foreign investors, the government is already looking at the following areas to improve aviation business in Nigeria. Upgrading our infrastructure for emphasis or elaboration. This includes upgrading the CAT-3 landing system at major airports, construction of the second runway in Abuja, which is about to commence right now, airport improvement programs through concession and government willingness to partner with companies to turn major airports into aerotropolis. So we are looking at the aircraft leasing company. It's part of the roadmap. Government welcomes major players 
in aircraft leasing and head resorts to invest in Nigeria airlines to provide state-of-the-art aircraft. With the shortage of qualified engineers, the current administration is willing to provide all the necessary support for the establishment of world-class MROs and training organizations. We also look at the area of forex availability. The current administration is aware that one of the setbacks entrepreneurs have suffered in Nigeria in recent years is the fluctuation of foreign exchange and its availability. And then we do apologize, it has affected you know, most of uh, the airlines um, that we have buses with you know, in, in Nigeria. It's one of the issues we actually went to sort out in the UAE. But this administration is committed to ensuring that Forex is readily available to entrepreneurs and I have directed, as the president, I'm reading the president's speech, I've directed the Central Bank of Nigeria host quarterly reconciliation meetings with a view to resolve this issue. Let's now head to the conversation for the day on the program. The new media has been inundated by a flurry of election petition tribunal decisions from the conduct of the February 25, 2023 National Assembly elections. While the mandate of some of the lawmakers have been upheld by the trial court, others were not so lucky and are now unsure of their political future. For some, it's an outright sack. For others, the court has ordered supplementary or rerun to decide an eventual win of the exercise in some constituencies. For instance, the member representing Idiato South North Federal Constituency in Imo State, Mr. Ikenga Oguchinri, has been removed by the tribunal over petition of invalid nomination by his party, the PDP. The court held that the PDP primaries that produced him was held outside his constituency, that's Aladima Shopping Mall, and was eventually barred from even participating in the rerun. Let's come to Lagos in Etiosa. The Labour Party candidate, Tadios Atta, PDP's Olubankole Wellington, and APC's Babajidi Obanikoro will be heading back to 32 polling units in Etiosa, federal constituency where elections either did not hold or mad by violence to finally decide a winner. Over 20,000 votes we understand are at stake because the margin of lead in the first poll is just about 5,000 votes. And that is if the decision is not challenged in the appellate courts. And now to provide legal perspective to the outcome of the tribunal's judgment across the country, we're being joined on the program by legal practitioner, Mr. Jiti Ogunye. Mr. Jiti, thank you so much for coming on the program. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me this afternoon. There's a lot to talk about, sir, but let's begin by your view. I'm sure you've been privy to loads of the outcome from the various election petition tribunals, especially the National Assembly election. What would be your immediate reactions from the ones you are aware of? Well, my immediate reaction is that my immediate reaction is that um, groups are generally um, we have a misbad. Uh, but what is instructive, most of all, is the fact that the National Assembly election and the presidential election took place on one day, the same day. And so um, the fact that a number of the uh, elections are being turned by the tribunal uh, is very suggestive that all was not well with the conduct of that election. Um, people are weighing on the issue of establishing cases of parties before the court. And that's a big difference. Uh, I'm not sure that anybody seriously suggested that the election across the board uh, was perfect. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this outcome. Uh, and so the big issue has been that many parties may not be able, uh, who are contesting the elections, uh, may not have been able to actually establish their cases before the court. So um, what tilts the scale or what uh, is responsible for this kind of factor is that uh, we must believe that those parties who have succeeded in obtaining election or getting a verdict uh, leading to a run, uh, etc., have been able to sufficiently establish their cases uh, before the court uh, or the tribunals. Again, the possibility of that is quite obvious because they had a smaller district uh, to deal with either a federal constituency or a senatorial district compared to uh, 
uh, a presidential election, which the whole country is the constituency that has to determine overall who is the winner of uh, that election. So, um, that's my general impression. With all sense of respect to the honorable judges uh, and justices, are there decisions from the National Assembly Tribunal that makes you squirm on your seat when you read the outcome? There's been a debate over Ikenga's ouster, I mean the man from Imo State, because some members of his party believe it's a party and pre-election matter, relying on the precedence of the Presidential Petition Tribunal. So are there decisions you've seen or read that makes you squirm from the legal perspective? You know, I don't want to join that debate. When a decision of court is rendered or a tribunal, particularly a decision of an election tribunal, uh, which is quite political, although we are discussing uh, the legal perspective here, we shouldn't forget that we're dealing with politics. Uh, too often you have those who are not satisfied with the outcome coming out to say that they're surprised by uh, the outcome of uh, the election petition is surprised by the, uh, the decision of the tribunal. Whether you're surprised or you disagree or you are dissatisfied, there's an appellate process through which uh, the decision of the tribunal can be further subjected to an appellate uh, legal scrutiny. And we've seen that happen in the case of um, uh, uh, the tribunal ruled wrong, and the two appellate uh, courts, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, ruled the other way. And that was very significant. So parties who feel strongly that their lordships, uh, the members of the tribunal, have heard in law or that uh, they misconstrued the facts uh, in whatever way can file an appeal on uh, the decision. And I am sure that the appellate court will be able to look at their complaints and look at it. But when the appellate court run, uh, validates uh, that decision, then uh, the parties have no choice but to accept that decision and be by the court. I'm going to put two questions in one. Maybe I'm going to run through the first one quite quickly. I'm sure that from a legal perspective, uh, some part of the law, maybe the electoral act, uh, which were tested uh, strongly in these 2023 elections, I'm sure you'd have seen a few things that would have suggested to look like a lacuna, some level of gap in the law that you think that should be fixed if we need to deepen our electoral jurisprudence. Are there things you've seen so far from the testing of uh, sections of the law so far that we've uh, experienced during the election that you think that uh, needs fixing? even before the next election, not necessarily off-cycle one? Now, there are a number of issues uh, that we need to settle with the electorate uh, so that we know definitively, uh, almost 24 years now, you know, even 24 years after uh, uh, 1999, uh, that we need to fix with the electoral system. The first is the issue of uh, the determination of uh, petitions. There's been big debate, debate around uh, the issue of whether all election petitions will be decided before the swearing. And I think it's a big issue uh, because people tend to believe that once an incumbent is sworn in, it's a lot more difficult to get him out of the seat. But I don't think so. Because we've had uh, governments who have lost uh, their seats uh, in this country. Uh, you know, even before the electoral act was reformed, uh, uh, Mr. Peter Abdi, for example, was a beneficiary of uh, that kind of thing. You know, he, he lost the seat and he came out of power. In those states, uh, Professor Sumo lost the seat and uh, uh, Adam Sumo came to power. And we've seen that and uh, I've seen that. So the possibility is that one day, if electoral system is not feel very well, or politicians keep rigging elections, we may have that kind of thing in the presidential system. So uh, that issue is there. And I will subscribe uh, to the idea of uh, uh, not looking at it so that we can be clear on what we need to do uh, moving forward. Whether election petitions must be concluded 
before the swearing of those who won that election. The second issue is the issue of um, what we have to do with the electoral act. These two people believe that uh, the issue of electronic transmission of results as decisions of courts are tumbling now, they have to be fixed. What the court have done now is to say that electronic transmission of results uh, via IRS for display and viewing is not a constitutional requirement, neither is it uh, a requirement of the Electoral Act. All we, the Electoral Act, right. permits INEC to uh, make guidelines. Okay. Now, so that we we'll have a dichotomy in the future, uh, a further review may uh, look positively towards the direction of including electronic transmission in the right. body of the Electoral Act, yes. so that it will not be possible in the future to dodge uh, that uh, requirement. Right. For me, yes. So so sorry for for cutting. Just, just were constrained by time, and that is exactly what I wanted to ask you when it came comes to the real time yes. transmission as against the guidelines yes. in Clause Thirty Eight, where it was quite unambiguous vis-à-vis uh, -vis what the electoral act says. But I think it's a good place to anchor it uh, for today. And sure, when we bring you back, we're going to explore all of that. Thank you so much for your time and coming on the program, yes, Mr. Jizio Gunye, legal practitioner. Yes. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right, let's move on to other stories. The governor of Oshun State, Ademola Adeleke, has directed security agencies in the state to launch special operations to arrest and prosecute gangs engaging in rivalry wars in Ijasha land. In a statement by the governor's spokesperson, he described the recent spate of violence and attacks in parts of the eastern senatorial district in his words as shocking and reprehensible, calling on the police service and other security agencies to act decisively to stop court clashes. It further states that they will no longer tolerate actions capable of disrupting the peaceful atmosphere in the state and will ensure perpetrators must be brought to book as urgently as possible. Now, ahead of the November 11 governorship elections, a group, of, a group known as the pan Ijo Political Action Group has joined in drumming support for the re-election bid of Governor Doyo Diri as declared during the media parley at the Nigerian Union of Journalists Complex in Yanagua, the state capital. They are calling for his re-election based on what they describe as his sterling performance in the past three and a half years. They also called on the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to resist any attempt to compromise the upcoming Bielsa governorship election. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, you are invited and welcomed by the leadership of this pan Ijo political action group, an assemblage of all Ijo's cutting across the three INC centurial zones to express our fraternal solidarity and endorsement of His Excellency Senator Doye Diri Squest for second term as Governor of Bias State. Uh, we have uh, another conversation just uh, before we wrap up the program. Now, I did tell you that when we started, or before I got on to speak with Mr. Jiti Ogunye, one of the places we cited in terms of election petition tribunal outcome is a Tiosa federal constituency where there is going to be a rerun or a supplementary election, if you will, because the court had decided there were 32 polling units where elections did not hold either because there were violence or some other reason. So the court decided and ordered for a rerun uh, pending. Of course, that will be determined by the incumbent Labour Party candidate who is in the House, who, uh, if he chooses to appeal the case at the appeal court, that's a different kettle of fish. But for now, that is the status of this particular situation in Etiosa local government area. And I'm being joined by the APC candidate of Etiosa local government area in that particular election, it was in the ninth House of Reps, Mr. Babajide um, of Banikoro. Thank you so much for joining us on the program, Mr. Banikoro. Thank you very much, my So let's get straight to it. Yesterday, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Kaido Kikulu, had uh, Banky W, uh, who is known as Banky W, back on uh, Luban Kolei Wellington as his official name. And he made a statement. Uh, when he was talking about the outcome of that exercise, he says, we can present a Tiosa with a kind of representation they've been missing. 
I don't know what your immediate reaction will be. You represented Etiosa in the ninth House of Reps. What have they been missing? Yes, I did. Well, I mean, everybody's entitled to their opinion and everybody's entitled to alter whatever statement you have in mind. It's a freedom of speech that is guaranteed by the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Um, if, he, if anybody that understands Etiosa very well and uh, allows himself or herself to sink with Etiosa, and with the, you, know, you go down to the grassroots, to the middle class and to the high class, you will understand that we had a representative that represented us well in all ramifications. And I think I did that to the best of my ability. Today, some of our barracks in um, uh, Ikoi here have been renovated because I moved the motion to say that our barracks need to be renovated because uh, security officers are best friends and they also deserve to live in a comfortable environment. Uh, in the three years that we had to operate, we renovated at least uh, nine roads that um, we facilitated innovation of. We facilitated schools, clinics, we brought numerous empowerment, coupled with the uh, motions and bills that I moved on the floor of the house. And I, up to date, I'm still the only representative that attends resident association meetings every end of the month to make sure that I don't leave my people uh, uh, unaware of what's going on in the National Assembly. I had a, a, a website that is running I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, just to make sure that if you Mr. want Banikoro. to contact me, you find it easy. So, are you with me? Yeah, I'm with you. Just because of time, I just wanted to run through a couple of questions yeah. so, so we can explore as much as possible on this subject matter. You say you represented your people well. Now, the election showed otherwise, in the, at least in the first poll. Uh, some may argue that Tadios won because of a protest vote against the establishment. Um, the, well, others may say you didn't represent the people well. Others may also argue that the influence of Oluba and Kole in the pop culture was also a factor. So what exactly were you missing that you did not come first, you did not come second, but you came third as an incumbent? Well, everybody, like, the first option you picked would, would rightly be the right uh, option to pick on. You know, Sometimes the election is more than um, uh, unpopular. Uh, there, there are other factors that come in that are beyond... Um, your control, and that's what happened in the 20, um, 23 general elections. We had factors that were above our, that came outside of our locality to influence the decision of the people on that particular day. It's going to be a different one now because it's going to be a local election. There is no forces coming out, there is no influence coming from anywhere. It's going to be a local election, and you get to see that uh, I'm going to come back. This is going to be the story of the comeback case. All right. Uh, Ms. Babajide Obanikoro, thank you so much for coming on the program. Trust me, I have loads of questions I want to ask you pertaining this uh, particular exercise uh, from, that came out from the tribunal and the decision. But that's all we have. And, and, I, and I'm sure I have, I have all the answers to your questions, but unfortunately, we don't have time. So okay. I look forward to the next opportunity to address this uh, question that you we'll, have. We will give you the opportunity, Mr. Obanikoro. Thank you for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, that's uh, the program for today. Thank you so much for coming along with us as we took you around the country in about 30 minutes on midday right here on Lunchtime Politics. You've been served your lunchtime. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.